second part. The world of darkness seemed to watch spellbound as the blast spread. That tiny flash of light. Virulent napalm flame swallowing just over 5,000 square feet. It was a simple but effective way of dealing with the invaders. Dee and Annette watched from the summit of a mound on the plains as the light was assimilated by the darkness. It's gone, Annette said, lowering the collapsible night vision goggles she held. It blew the entire past to smithereens. She looked terrified. The rain mercilessly pelted her thin vinyl raincoat. We had an enemy in the sky. Said the hoarse voice that issued from a little ahead of D and off to the left. And the hand that gripped the reins. Strain her eyes as she might, and that still didn't see anything. There was only his left hand. The voice continued. I suppose it's necessary that we answer our employer's question. You see, there was an enemy in the sky above us. And another foe attacked them. One of those other four, I suppose. As a result of their battle, one of them was shot down. That explosion would have been a napalm bomb they were carrying. Which one was taken out? We'll know soon enough. If one of them is in league with those four, who in the world could the other one be? That I don't know. To be flying in weather like this, it could be a smuggler or something. Only that wasn't any flying machine. There was no sound of engines from it either. In which case, it had to be some stray demon bird, or else a bodyguard for you. For me. Then my father might have hired them. They were up there either watching over you, or looking for you. And judging from the weather, probably the latter. You'd best pray the one that got shot down wasn't guarding you. Oh, I don't care for this one bit. All this killing and dying. Annette furrowed her brow, shaking her head from side to side as if to deny the truth of any of this. Not that she was mourning the dead. Her tone and expression made it clear she found it revolting and bothersome to have others dying around her. Eighteen years I've lived in peace. So why did these musty old nobles have to climb out of their graves now? And why are they after my family? And the sort of trouble we could do without. Do you suppose it's too much to hope that explosion wiped out the lot of them? Since we're safe and sound, it's safe to assume the same goes for the enemy. I think they converged here to either snatch you or butcher you. And they're probably already headed this way. Oh dear. After a short rest, you must take me home post haste. A short rest? Well, we can't go any farther in this downpour. My clothes are soaked, and the strain has left me exhausted. Let's take a break somewhere. We press on. The shriveled voice had suddenly been replaced by one of iron. Low and soft, his tones still made it clear he would brook no objections. Yet Annette listened to it like a dotard while glaring at the man's black back. And I'm telling you that your employer is tired and we need to rest. Try to remember your place in this equation. Change horses, said the owner of that broad back. 
At the bottom of the pass, Dee had intended to put her onto the extra horse he'd taken from the coach. But the incident with the napalm had forced them to gallop away at top speed, so that Annette was still riding double on Dee's cyborg horse. Annette didn't budge. While riding double was still a hassle, she didn't even want to move. I don't want to. Too much bother. When she said that, the cyborg horse had already started forward through the needling rain. Stop for a minute. Every bone in my body is creaking, and my behind is killing me. Has to be better than dying. The steely voice silenced the mayor's daughter. The enemy is already closing in, and there are four of them. We'll ride through the night. Annette shuddered. Earlier, the demons pursuing her had allowed Dee to pass without lifting a finger to stop him. And that was only right, she thought. And having witnessed the greatness that lay within the gorgeous young man, and the skilled swordsmanship that had dispatched Baron Hyden with a single blow, she wanted to laugh in their faces and tell them they could go to hell. However, the malevolence that crazed their eyes as they looked at Dee and the ghastly aura that emanated from every inch of them had also been enough to make Annette's blood run cold. These are nobles, she knew in her heart of hearts as she clung to Dee. And though her faith in Dee was absolute, and these assassins weren't to be taken lightly, and four of them were coming. You're right. Right on, then. Uh, ain't you the smart cookie? The horse voice said, and the tone crying a laughter that infuriated Annette. She promised herself she'd find out the source of it and make it pay. As they were coming down the hill, something occurred to her and she had to ask. They said there were five including the cousins, right? But you cut down one leaving the other four who were back there. So how did they manage to shoot down a foe in the sky overhead? And there was no answer. And there was no answer. She figured it probably didn't matter anyway. No matter how many of them there were, he would cut them down. And because this gorgeous young man was clearly that iron-bound rule made flesh, they reached the bottom of the hill, giving a light kick to his horse's belly, and Dee spurred it into a dash. Page break. Racing through the night, ignoring even the dawn, it was nearly noon when they finally reached the town of Ligatum, a mining town with a population of about a thousand. The high-quality uranium ore excavated there kept the place prosperous. At any rate, we've got to get a room at a hotel. Let the girlie get some sleep. And procure a horse, eh? The horse voice said. I'll thank to you. Make that, young lady. Annette said with displeasure. But she seemed to have no other complaints. As he advanced on his cyborg horse, the bustle along the street died. Unnoticing his good looks, pedestrians were left breathless. Though one might have expected Annette to be disgusted by this, since entering town she'd powdered her face and applied lipstick, sitting up straight and proud to show her good looks off to even better effect. She believed herself to be the cause of the pedestrians' silence. And the girl behind you seems she's been fussed over up till now. Still... She's pretty good looking. And the girl behind you. Seems she's been fussed over up till now. Still, she is pretty good looking. The hand gripping the reins remarked with amusement. And Dee replied, If we could, I'd like to pass right through. But we can't do that.
unheard by anyone else. This was a conversation between Dee and his left hand alone. Probably not. She's putting on a brave face. But the girls all took her out. You could knock her over with a feather. You gotta be tough being a beauty, though. Needs to work on everything besides her looks. What in the blazes? Not three feet in front of the steed. A mass of brown had slammed into the road and then swiftly resolved into a human form. It was a boy, who appeared to be about ten years old. And though grimacing and clutching his back, he looked impudently up at the second-story saloon window he'd fallen from. Hold it right there, you little shit. A man's voice snarled viciously. The hell I will. That's what you get for what you did to that girl. And next time, you won't get off so easily. And the boy fired back, his words flying like bullets from a repeating rifle. And then, in the blink of an eye, he disappeared into the crowd. In the course of doing so, apparently he'd bumped into someone, as there was a thud, and a cry of, Jerk! What are you doing, staring at a woman like that? Further curses rang out, and then faded. Annette snuck a peek in that direction, but Dee didn't even glance at the boy. When they arrived at the hotel another fifty yards away, there were angry shouts and a number of footfalls behind them. But Dee was so expressionless, all that seemed like events on another world as he climbed up. But Dee was so expressionless, all that seemed like events on another world, as he climbed off his sovereign course, tethered both steeds to the hitching post, and brought Annette into the hotel. Fighting company with Annette in front of her room, Dee went back outside. He headed straight for the bird man. After twisting and turning down numerous alleyways, Dee was greeted by a small shop with a rather spacious front yard. The sign read, Pigeons, bugs, butterflies, and more for messaging. What Dee asked for was a recon hawk. Also, that camera has to be able to transmit. The hunter said, And I need you to put some basic armor on it. In that case, it'll also need secondary propulsion. The proprietor replied somewhat dreamily, after gazing in rapture at Dee's face for more than ten seconds. All my big models are rented out right now. All that's left is one bitty one. Got a camera on board, but it'll barely make a sixty-mile round trip. Good enough. Okay, that'll be an extra five thousand dollars. No sooner had the man finished saying that, than the very end of his bulbous nose vanished. He only clutched his nose after bright blood had welled to the surface of a slice no bigger than the tip of his pinky. And the scream came even later. This isn't the first time we've had to have attachments put on a recon bird, you know. But you play us for a sucker. But you thought wrong. Three hundred and fifty dollars should do it, eh? Negotiations be damned. More than shock and fear from having the tip of his nose taken off. It was out of terror and not understanding what had happened, and that the shopkeeper nodded. He didn't even have enough faculties left to even notice a dubious change in the customer in Black's tone of voice. 
He was bowing intensely and repeatedly, like a clockwork automaton. When the door opened and a brown-haired boy stuck his head in. Hey, isn't that the square to you? The left hand murmured. And the boy shot a quick glance in that direction, but couldn't discern anything. I'd heard someone had gone into this rip-off master's shop. Mister? And the boy said, and then his mouth fell open. Still, it was admirable the way he suddenly slapped his own cheeks, swiftly returning sanity to both his eyes and expression. Man, you sure are one handsome cuss. His manly voice carried a feeling of pure admiration. His words were followed by a foul stench. From the look of his tattered shirt and trousers, and the way his hair was plastered to his head, he and the bathtub hadn't been on speaking terms for quite some time now. Boy, he continued, wish I'd been born with a face like that, too. Thanks to my mom. I've got kind of a pug nose. Well, not much I can do about that. Uh, I'm Pick. And by the way, I wouldn't do business here if I were you. Dear. But before the hunter could ask the boy why he said that, the shop owner showed it with bulging eyes. What'd you just say, you little thieving bastard? He'd pulled at a towel to cover his nose, but as it was also soaked with blood, it remained a shocking sight. Shifting his eyes from the smirking boy, Pick, to D, he said, That little prick's a well-known troublemaker. Just a snot-nosed brat, but he sasses adults. Steals liquor from the bar, helps hookers run off, blackmails, and shakes down travelers. If we were to catch him, the mayor pay a reward. And don't go believing anything that one tells you. What are you talking about, Jerk? Pick sneered. The liquor in the bar was left over as so I helped myself. The girl from the cat house's time was up, but she was being forced to keep working under a bogus contract. And all I ever blackmailed or shook down were stupid rich folks. No matter how much money they had. This here's the frontier. Act like that, and you'll fall prey to bandits the second you step out of town. I taught him a lesson about survival. All I was doing was getting paid in return for the service. Are you little? And the shopkeeper reached for the rifle he had hanging on the wall. The gun brushed his fingers, then vanished. What? In the... Setting down the rifle, Dee said. You said he was a cheat, didn't you? Didn't you? Pick gave a quiet, mature nod, saying, Now, I don't know what sort of bird you asked for, but this old coop probably told you right now. He ain't got nothing but little ones. So if it's going to carry a payload, it'll need some upgrades. And that'll cost you extra. The shop owner went white. His nose even stopped bleeding. Why, you little... Right? I wouldn't use this place. Pick said, grinning at D. If it's a recon bird you need, I've got a good one. And you can have it for half of what this place usually charges. Naturally, that includes the upgrades. Don't you believe that little bastard? Ask anyone. They'll test me running an honest business. Of course they will. Around these parts. You're all in on it together. And this whole town's run to the core. And the merchants are all in cahoots, and they've got ties with the sheriff and the town hall. They rip off travelers, the only honest people in town, and they can't pull a fast one on me. No, I turn the tables on them. That's why they try and run me out. Not even turning to face the shop owner, Dee said, The deal is off. But that kid's better than the likes of you, it seems. The shop owner turned a stunned gaze to the vicinity of Dee's left hip.
Better than the likes of you, it seems. And the shop owner turned a stunned gaze to the vicinity of Dee's left hip. Out of the corner of his eye, he caught a grubby face ducking back out, and the figure in black headed for the door. Second part, end. <laughs>